So, I mean, roughly speaking, George, a graph database is basically a database that stores a graph in a, uh, in a native graph model and serves up queries and enables you to process and query graph data. What else would you add to that? Uh, yes, a good thing to um, uh, good thing to to keep in mind here is that um, uh, people all often get confused um, between um, graph databases, uh, making the distinction between graph databases and graph processing frameworks. So, uh, depending on your use case, um, uh, you may need the graph database, or you may as well. Uh, do uh, do well with a graph processing framework. The difference basically is uh, the following. So um, if you already have, and probably most people already have like a database uh, solution uh, and they just want to do some graph analytics on top of that, possibly it, it, it's possible that uh, they may be able to do that by basically offloading the data to a graph uh, processing framework and just doing the, their analytics there. Uh, that basically means that they won't be able to build like new applications on top of that. All that you're able to do with the graph processing framework is do some analytics on top of uh, existing data. That may be enough for you. That may be like a good start to, to get your toes wet in the, in the graph uh, world, let's say. Uh, but if you want to do more, then you want to have like a full-blown graph database and that basically means not just being able to do reads which is what you do with the graph processing framework but you know the whole deal create read update delete everything that you need to support in order to build like applications on top of a graph data model sounds good so for the agenda today we promised six things we'd cover and here are the six so data modeling and frameworks what we've touched on um, Use cases, there are now really clear, well, fairly clearly defined uh, categories of use cases we'll go over. Uh, we'll talk about what developers need to know. Um, we'll then break for questions that you might have on what we've covered. Then we'll talk about uh, the impact of graph on IT. Uh, we'll talk about issues of performance and scale, which is a, you know, a pretty popular topic with, uh, with graph databases. Uh, We'll talk, touch on native graph databases versus multi-model graph database platforms. Uh, Aerospike, who I work for, uh, is a multi-model database that, that offers a graph data model and querying. And uh, others like Neo4j and uh, TigerGraph, they are native graph databases. What's the, what, which is better? Well, you can decide yourself. Um, at the very end, I'll give a very brief introduction to Aerospike Graph. This is not meant to be a Aerospike product uh, pitch. Uh, it's more about uh, talking about, as I mentioned, the evaluation and decision making around graph platforms, and then we'll take some final questions. So first, uh, let's talk about data model and framework. So uh, George, overall, uh, we, we've uh, selected two uh, of the more common ones, uh, labeled pop property graph, and resource description framework rdf can you please uh give us an idea of what what the differences are and and why you would choose one over another yeah sure so uh, as opposed to let's say uh relational the relational data model where things are pretty straightforward i mean you have tables you have uh, views you have uh, joins you know Pretty much every, uh, doesn't matter what vendor you choose, the data model stays the same. And graph things are a little bit different because there are two variants of uh, how people choose to model graphs. I'll start with RDF because it was uh, historically, let's say, uh, the first one. So in RDF, and I need to uh, emphasize here that RDF was originally conceived as um, a data model meant to uh, to facilitate the one use case, uh, which was uh, publishing data on the web. Uh, so that means it comes with, uh, cer with certain baggage, let's say. So uh, both positive and negative. Uh, let's start with the positive. Uh, the fact that a very positive one is that uh, things uh, that you model in RDF come with URIs. That means that they're globally referenceable which in turn makes it a very good choice uh, if you want to uh, 
to facilitate uh, data integration use cases, for example. So the key uh, abstraction that uh, you use in, uh, in the RDF world is uh, uh, so-called triples. Triples uh, are uh, correspond to su subject, predicate, and an object, which is very close to uh, the syntactic structure of language, actually. And again, that reflects uh, the history of RDF. So uh, here we have an example, uh, like uh, we have uh, nodes that uh, represent uh, can represent uh, subjects. We have edges that uh, typically come as predicates, and we have objects that can be other nodes or uh, they can also be literals. For example, uh, if you have a, um, if you want to express uh, a fact such as um, George lives in Athens, for example, uh, you would, that's George is your subject, lives is your predicate, and Athens is the object. And you can model your object as, as a literal or as another uh, type of uh, node. So, it's it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting concept and I've briefly talked about uh, the positive sides uh, that uh, it brings. The negative side uh, the negative sides of RDF is that it's it can be quite verbose, uh, especially compared to uh, the alternative, which is a labeled property graph. So, in labeled property graphs, uh, we just do away with the concept of subject predicate triple uh, object. So things are not triples. Uh, you have two key uh, abstractions that you work with in, in in the LPG world. You have nodes and you have edges, and 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 that's it. And both of these abstractions can have properties. So, for example, uh, if you want to model the same fact that I mentioned previously, George lives in Athens. Uh, you would probably uh, what you would probably do is you would create two nodes, one node for George and one node. Uh, for Athens, and you would uh, connect them with another uh, node uh, called uh, lives in. Or you could also just use one node, uh, George, and just give it to uh, just give it a property lives in and fill in uh, uh, the value Athens in that. So that already kind of uh, hints that there are different ways to model things. Uh, but the main takeaway here is that uh, depending on your use case, uh, you may want to go with one or the other model. Uh, and that's that's a choice you need to make actually uh, rather early in your journey. So at the very beginning of the presentation, I said this wasn't a Graph 101, but a Graph 101 concept uh, I should mention is that relationships in a graph database are treated as first class citizens, where is if you want to implement graph in a relational model, there's a lot of extra programming and uh, considerations that you have to make. So that, that's also unique to graph databases. So you mentioned frameworks uh, and uh, you've named three here, uh, starting with OpenCypher uh, and um, that uh, that organization and the uh, GQL uh, has been in the news very recently. Um, but uh, tell me uh, about these frameworks and 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 their uh, significance. Yeah, so we already talked a little bit about RDF. Um, I wouldn't. I'm not sure. I would actually call it a framework. It's more like a modeling abstraction with, with that comes with its own uh, stack. Let's say of uh, technologies. Uh, what definitely is a framework is uh, Tinkerpop. So Tinkerpop, as you can see here in the, in the slide that uh, you're sharing right now, also has its own stack. So basically you can think of Tinkerpop as a specification uh, that comes with uh, different layers and different implementations for that layer. And in the end, it's basically like a graph processing and querying framework that can sit on top of any backend and just lets you do uh, compute and querying on top of that backend using the uh, LPG abstraction. Now, OpenCypher, on the other hand, uh, and GQL that you just mentioned, is more of a graph query language. And uh, to, to, to do the comparison, let's say, with, with Tinkerpop, uh, it's not really a specification. It's not really a framework per se, but um, 
instead what happens is that different vendors may implement it in in different ways so with the specification part is the query language and then from that point on every vendor is free to to do as as they please basically and, uh, to uh, just to add quickly about gql so gql is a newly minted standard that uh, tries to do uh, sort of bridge the gap between different vendor implementations in the labeled property graph world because open cipher again historically comes from one vendor it has been open sourced in the process but now uh, lots of vendors came together to work on that and they have actually standardized it so that's expected to bring a big boost in the graph data world so i guess the question is uh for developers uh, or operators, uh, does the underlying framework really affect what they do? Um, you know, if, does someone need to know that they are using Tinkerpop or 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 whatnot, or is it really more about the query language? Uh, you don't really need to know the internals of each framework. I think the emphasis really is on the on the query language. So uh, RDF comes with its own query language, which is called uh, Sparkle. Uh, Tinkerpop has uh, its own query language, which is called Kremlin. And we already talked about OpenCypher and uh, the new query language, uh, GQL. Uh, the difference, there are differences here, obviously. There are also uh, similarities. But um, in my mind, the I would call it like the biggest difference is uh, in Gremlin. So Gremlin, as opposed to both other query languages, is... Uh, is a procedural query language. So that basically means that you have to write not just the query, but also you have to write for every query uh, the uh, specific way that you want it to be executed, sort of like giving instructions to the compiler how to run your query. You can think of it that way. Whereas uh, Sparkle and OpenCypher, it's a declarative. There are both declarative uh, query languages. So you just write the patterns that you want to match and the compiler does the rest. There are, again, there are plus and cons in each of these uh, each of its services, but it's something that you need to know to make a choice. Very good. We're going to talk about that in a moment uh, in terms of uh, what developers need to know. Um, but let's talk about graph use cases because the uh, you know graph databases have really not been around all that long, um, and uh, they are definitely progressing and evolving. So probably the most uh, well-known uh, or, or most numerous are knowledge graphs uh, that Neo4j really, uh, really pioneered. Um, but more lately, um, there are transactional systems, OLTP graphs, if you will, uh, or analytic systems, more like an OLAP use case. And then finally, um, another area that uh, that is very interesting is the application of graph technologies uh, with uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. So let's look at each of those individually with some use cases for each. So, uh, George, the three we've chosen are uh, linking identities and recommendation systems, uh, security threat analysis, and building knowledge bases. Um, can, what can you say generally about knowledge graphs? Uh, what, what should people know about them? Well, in a way, knowledge graphs are the uh, the oldest use case uh, of them all because uh, uh, we talked a little bit about the history of RDF and how it was the first technology really that was at least standardized uh, in in this space. I mean, there was graph processing before that, but the first standard was, was RDF. And so... The initial use case was precisely building interconnected knowledge bases. And um, to be even more specific, uh, it was about publishing data on the web, which is like the interconnected knowledge base and the, the, the primary one, let's say. And obviously what can be done at a web scale can also be done at smaller scale. And this is a, a use case at which knowledge graphs assign. And the main reason is that, uh, well, with knowledge graphs, uh, you get some you get also the notion of a schema so you get to define semantics and how uh, things relate to other things and that's that's something that knowledge graphs are, are very good at now so, when it comes to go, sorry, sorry go, go ahead. ahead no you go okay i was just going to talk a little bit about the uh, the other use cases so entity linking and recommendation systems and so when you have mm, uh when you have basically 
concepts that uh, are related to each other and you are able to know exactly how they're related and this is what knowledge graphs enable you to do you can define exactly how each uh, concept is related to each other then obviously that uh, that means that uh, you can build better recommendation systems because you sort of have this a priori knowledge that you don't have if you come with a blank slate and you can also link different uh, types of, uh, of concepts. And I think it's the same the same principle, let's say, that is behind uh, the, the security threat analysis uh, use case. So if you come with a certain uh, pre, uh, a priori knowledge that you can apply, uh, that means that uh, you can you can do better than just just starting uh, from from scratch. Yeah, we give a, a life sciences example of a knowledge base. Uh, I actually have a friend who used to work at Lincoln Center in New York City and uh, created a, a graph uh, database of all their performances and all the orchestras and all the pieces they played and all the conductors and were able to provide an interactive uh, interface into them. So uh, that, as you mentioned, is the oldest. Um, more, more recently, our graph OLAP has become um, more popular. Can you describe what, what that means? Yes, sure. So, um, uh, so as, um, as the size of data, the volume of data has, has been growing, uh, people have been taking note of the fact that, well, many times uh, what really matters in those data sets is not so much the volume, but uh, the connection. So, the value in the analysis many times comes not so much from uh, being able to load uh, infinite uh, infinite volumes, but actually finding what are the valuable connections in, in the data. So this is where graph databases and graph processing frameworks as well uh, sign. So uh, just to uh, mention a few of the use cases uh, you've uh, you've lined up here. Uh, again, let's let's start with uh, what's probably the the most famous one. So PageRank, uh, the, it's the algorithm that uh, started uh, on which the Google Empire is is built. And besides being a famous one, it's also a very good example of uh, what graph algorithms and graph analytics can can do. So it's the it's the whole idea of finding. Uh, creating algorithms that find connections uh, between uh, your your data points and uh, leveraging those connections to uh, to infer basically and you can apply that for pricing analysis or analysis of buyer behavior or you know the list goes on and on basically so the next is something that's uh, kind of close to our heart here at Aerospike uh, OLTP graphs and that is graph databases that can handle punishing transactional environments where there's a lots of reads and writes and updates. Uh, and uh, in particular, um, we have a pretty strong heritage in ad tech and you know, they are facing uh, the loss of deterministic data as in cookies from browsers and uh, graph databases and creating identity graphs um, are one of the ways that these companies are uh, establishing identity, resolving identity. Um, so, uh, but also there are recommendation engines and and another uh, yet another case for fraud detection, but in, in a real time manner where the amount of time you have to resolve a fraudulent transaction is in milliseconds rather than seconds. Um, anything else that you would say about uh, OLTP and graph database? Um, well. I I like to think about it by uh, by drawing an analogy. So um, in the relational uh, database world, well, you don't normally use the same type, the same database to process your uh, uh, transactional applications and the same database to do your uh, offline analytics. So the same pretty much applies in, in the graph world so you're looking for a different uh, set of uh, qualities basically a different uh, set of requirements in your OLTP versus your OLAP solution so obviously in the OLTP use case you're looking for uh, low latency uh, transactional support and, and all of those things that you would normally expect in, in such an environment uh, and finally, uh, probably a subject that could take uh, 
a webinar or 10 uh, on its own is, yeah. uh, is how graph will figure in AI and ML. It's a space that is evolving really quickly. Um, but uh, just uh, just did a little bit of research and uh, applying AI to recommendation systems uh, using graphs is, is one possibility. Um, or, or actually adding some reasoning uh, and, uh, to, uh, and language models to uh, knowledge graphs. And then, of course, there's always fraud and cybersecurity applications to this. What, what are you seeing out there uh, that's interesting, George? Yeah, I mean, you're right. It's actually this is an umbrella term that uh, basically um, hosts, let's say, quite different use cases, not so much in terms of um, applications, but more in terms of technology and implementation. So just taking, uh, just picking two uh, to, to emphasize here. So you mentioned knowledge graph reasoning. Again, this is uh, in fact an old use case among the oldest ones that has seen uh, renewed interest. So uh, being able to do reasoning, uh, inference uh, using knowledge graphs and semantics and ontologies and that kind of stuff was one of the um, archetypical, let's say, use cases of, of RDF, where uh, the idea was that, well, if you could build a very detailed uh, schema, what is called an ontology in, in, in that world, and also uh, specify rules for inference, then you could basically add new uh, you could infer new facts in your knowledge base. And so if you have a question like, uh, I don't know, is uh, George uh, a person, for example, if you already had the fact in your knowledge base that, well, George is an employee and you had the rule that, well, employees are persons, then you could infer that, well, George is a person. So it's it's an old one that has seen renewed interest, uh, mostly because of the advent of uh, large language models and uh, the uh, uh, so-called uh, retrieval augmented generation uh, flavor that uh, is uh, that people are all building to uh, to enhance them so it's a, it's a very large language models are obviously a very different paradigm so you don't have a priori knowledge in the, in the same way that you have in knowledge graphs you have like a big blob on which you you train your model basically uh, and this is why, uh, in fact, those two seem to uh, mingle well together. So on the one hand, you have like the non-deterministic kind of uh, application and uh, answers that you can get from large language models. On the other hand, you have uh, what's, um, what's a very strict and formal body of knowledge that uh, uh, comes with uh, modeling uh, your, your uh, uh, knowledge base as a knowledge graph. So if you're able to somehow combine these two, you can maybe have the best of both worlds. And that's a very interesting direction that uh, things uh, seem to be taking. Yes, there's also a lot of talk about vector databases and how they may intersect with, with graph databases. Is there, uh, is there yet a rule about where you go with which, George? Um, well, obviously, you know, vector databases can easily be uh, the topic for another webinar or five or 10. Uh, but uh, let's just say that uh, like any other um, specialized, let's say, uh, type of data modeling, uh, we see a lot, uh, what we see happening a lot these days is that, well, for example, you see graph databases adding vector capabilities uh, to, to their arsenal. So the idea there being, well, you know, if you're already using vendor X, instead of going out there and adding an, yet another vendor uh, to that, that only does vector, well, maybe you can still keep using your uh, existing vendor X, uh, which, by the way, also gives you some vector capabilities. You know, that's it's it's a topic in and of itself, whether that's a good idea or not, and under which conditions and so on. But uh, let's just say that it happens. Yes, and a little commercial message that uh, Aerospike has announced, uh, we will be uh, releasing uh, vector database capabilities. So I couldn't help myself, uh, but let's move on. Uh, so we've talked a little bit about uh, what developers need to know already in terms of, uh, in terms of query languages, um, but let's, uh, let's just briefly talk about it again. Um, so yeah. Gremlin, uh, part of the open source uh, Tinkerpop, uh, technology. Uh, what what can you say about uh, about Gremlin? 
Well, uh, Gremlin has lots of things going for it. So it's uh, it's uh, vendor neutral. So um, you can use it no matter uh, what uh, backend uh, you have uh, you have there. Uh, uh, it's it's focused on property graph traversal. So um, depending, it's Gremlin is an interesting one precisely because it's not tied to any specific uh, vendor, uh, but it comes with its own stack. You can think of it in a way as uh, a Java virtual machine for graphs. So in the same way that a, a virtual machine abstracts the intermediate layer and you don't need to know the specifics of the hardware that it's running on, well, uh, in the same way, Tinkerpop abstracts the specifics of uh, the backend vendor that it's running on. So in the end, you don't need to know or care about it. You just type in your uh, Gremlin query and you're, you're good to go. Um, well, what may be hard for some people to swallow uh, about Gremlin is the fact that, well, as mentioned previously, uh, you need to basically be very specific about how your query runs. And depending on uh, how you do that, uh, you may even get differences in performance. So that basically means that you need to know uh, the shape of your data well, and you need to even know the data, the distribution your data so um, depending on where let's let's uh, state it in in the relational way so depending on which join let's say you put first or in this case uh, which node you choose to traverse first you may actually get a difference in performance so you need to be aware of that and you need to take it into account when uh, writing your queries Okay, we've already touched on GQL, uh, published as an open standard this month, actually just a couple of weeks ago, based on Neo4j Cypher. Um, what, uh, how would you relate that to Gremlin? Um, well, as it has some similarities with Gremlin, so uh, it's it's also vendor neutral, even though it uh, originated from uh, from Neo4j. Well, eventually it got open sourced, and now it even got to the point where it's standardized. So vendors are already uh, working on implementations. Uh, it's uh, easier probably for most people to get started with because it was uh, intentionally built uh, to resemble SQL to uh, to the extent possible. So it's uh, much easier uh, typically for people to work with, initially at least. And uh, well, as opposed to, uh, to Gremlin, you don't necessarily need to know that much uh, level. You don't need to have that much level of detailed knowledge about your data to, to make it work. Okay, and finally, it sounds to me like RDF uh, is a bit more specialized. Who, who is going to be choosing RDF and, and what are the reasons why they would? Uh, well, RDF and Sparkle, it's a standardized query language, also has uh, some things going for it. Well, to begin with, up until very, very recently, like a couple of weeks ago, it was the only real standard in, in the graph world. And again, interoperability is a huge plus, obviously. So you can switch vendors and just keep your queries running without any changes. And that's a huge win. And obviously, you know, uh, the people in the LPG world realized that that was something missing uh, in, in, in their uh, stack. So this is why they came together and uh, def defined the GQL standard. Uh, besides that, uh, um, there are also some, some similarities between uh, GQL or Cypher and Sparkle. So in some ways, they are also... Um, they're both modeled after SQL, so they try to keep the syntax as much similar as possible. Obviously, this is not always 100% uh, the case because, well, there are different uh, data models after all. Uh, another thing to know, which is noteworthy about Sparkle, is that, well, in fact, it's not just a query language. It's also a protocol. So... Um, Sparkle uses HTTP, uh, the HTTP uh, protocol uh, under the hood. So that basically means that uh, you get data integration for free. So if you have different nodes and they both, uh, or they can be two or three or more, or doesn't matter how many, uh, what you basically get is federated queries for free because all you need to know is like the uh, uh, the address, the IP address of the node you want to address and 
you can just type your query and the query will automatically run over the wire remotely. Got it. All right, so the other thing that developers will come in uh, touch with are uh, IDEs and visualizations for Gremlin, you have the Gremlin console, which is uh, basically a command line interface into Gremlin. Um, but then you have uh, a commercial tool called G.V. Uh, just uh, uh, Aerospike is in a partnership with uh, G.V and uh, is available for our platform. So, uh, and then you have each other vendor has their own consoles, the Neo4j browser you see there's the Amazon Neptune Visualizer, I think it's called, and Tiger Graph and Arango and, and a number of others. Are there any other commercial uh, IDEs or visualization tools that are, that are especially common, George? Um, well, there are, but it's, I think it's important to, uh, to make a distinction here. So uh, you, you have both IDs and visualization tools, and these are basically uh, aimed at different audience. So IDs may also be um, visual, and the examples that you mentioned here actually showcase that, uh, because, well, if you're working with graphs, having like a visual interface, even for writing code, can be very helpful. Uh, however, these tools are basically aimed at developers, so people who write code. Uh, however, not everyone who wants to visualize like graph data sets is a developer. So you have also a different set of tools that are aimed at analysts. So people who want to explore uh, graph data sets, not necessarily by typing in queries, but just by ways of visual exploration. So you can think of it as well, BI for graph, basically. So you have both of these families, let's say, family of tools. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about that in a moment. At this point, I want to see, are there any questions that have come in? Uh, one second. Uh, I have uh, relatives. What are the relative size uh, and, uh, and changing emphasis uh, of OLTP versus OLAP versus knowledge? Uh, graph use cases. Is there one that's a, that's uh, growing faster than the other at this point, George? Or, or is it uh, mm. the ocean rising for all boats? Um, that's actually very hard to say because at least to the best of my knowledge, I don't think there's like any um, any data on this, any, any hard data. Uh, all we have, or at least, or, you know, just to speak for myself, I only have a sense of uh, just what's going on in the market by talking to people and seeing uh, and hearing about implementation. So based on that, I would say that, well, knowledge graphs seem to be, let's put it that way, knowledge graphs at least have lots of mindset at this point, uh, precisely because of what we already briefly touched upon, that they seem to be a very good tool uh, to work in tandem with uh, large language models, which is what everyone is trying to capitalize on at the moment. Uh, because when you marry the strengths of both, you get systems that are quite, quite robust. Now, that said, I think the other two use cases, so uh, graph uh, OLTP and OLAP, I think they're, they're both on the rise. Uh, what may be a little bit uh, behind in comparison, not for any other reason, but just because of the fact that uh, it's uh, a use case that has um, that came to the fore later is uh, Graph AI. So that's a recently new development and uh, one that uh, people are not very familiar with. And just to quickly add to that, uh, uh, we run a poll. So uh, one of the many hats I wear is I organize uh, an event, uh, which is around graphs and graph databases and all of that stuff. So we recently ran a poll and we asked our audience, uh, it's, it's called Connected Data World. And so we asked our audience to give us their opinion on what use cases they're mostly interested in and what their backgrounds are and how proficient they are. And by far, uh, the one that people were less familiar with was graph AI, but at the same time, it was one that people were very, very much interested in learning more about. So it shows that it, there's lots of potential. I have another question that has come in. It's about use cases. Uh, 
can you suggest some use cases where you would where it's preferable to use a label property graph versus RDF? Uh, as usual, it's probably it depends. But um, uh, is there a, a clear indicator when you should go for one or the other, George? Yes, I would say that if you have a use case uh, in which um, inference, so uh, being able to generate new knowledge based on uh, your domain, based on your domain knowledge, if that's something that you have use for, then you should be looking at knowledge graphs and specifically the RDF uh, flavor. Um, the same goes for uh, use cases uh, that are basically data integration. So if you have a scenario in which you have different uh, different nodes, uh, different databases, different data sets, and you want to somehow um, un unify them all, not necessarily by, I mean, there's always the option of, um, you know, the so-called data lake scenario. So you basically do lots of ETL and you dump everything in one common repository and they're done. Of course, again, you know, there's plus and cons in that scenario. If you want to do that, fine. You don't need the knowledge graph. You don't need the graph database to do that. You just need the data lake, go and do it. But if you don't want to do that and you want to have like a federated data integration scenario, then you should be definitely looking at knowledge graphs because this is where they sign. If, on the other hand, you're more interested in, uh, well, OLTP or all up analytics, then maybe you should start at least by looking at uh, LPG uh, solutions because, because of the fact basically that uh, due to their model, they are less verbose. So that means uh, it comes down to having less... Um, if you if we were talking about relational, you you would say that well you have less rows and less columns in your database, so that makes it easier to scan. We don't have rows and columns in in the graph world, but well we have nodes and edges. So if you have less nodes and less, less edges, again easier to scan. So there's a, another implementation uh, I should mention, George. Some people uh, elect to do graph use cases without a graph database. We actually Aer Aerospike has some big customers. Uh, I think PayPal and Adobe um, that have built graph solutions using Aerospike as the data store, but the, it, but before we offered graph database, so they really did it mm -hmm. on their own. I imagine that's a pretty involved and difficult challenge to take on. Uh, yes, I mean, in in many ways. First of all, because if you're if your backend doesn't come with a graph API or a graph processing framework, or if it's not a graph database, then it means that you need to add more components in your stack. So you have overhead in that respect. Then obviously uh, you need to, uh, to learn how it works. You need to integrate it and you need to familiarize yourself with it. And you will always have the um, the ETL and data transfer issue. So you will basically have to move your data to from wherever it is to wherever it is that you're taking them to do your, your analysis on. So yes, it's possible. Um, in some cases, it may make sense, but I think above a certain scale, let's say, maybe it stops making uh, that much sense. All right, well, let's continue with our list of six. The next one is the impact of graph on IT operations. And uh, just wanted to talk about the personas. Um, graph databases, like any database, uh, has an operational component, has a developer component, and nowadays uh, there is applicability to data scientists. So the roles that um, we see for operations, obviously at the top is the CIO, but DBAs, and I imagine graph DBAs are kind of a specialized breed right now, um, but also IT infrastructure, cloud infrastructure, DevOps. And then you have the developers themselves as a CTO, and you have graph developers, graph architects, and then finally data sciences uh, with a CDO and uh, data engineers and, and data scientists. So wanted to go through each one of those individually with you, George. So first, um, if we look at operations, um, the operators have, uh, they, they define uh, the scalability and extensibility expectations 
uh, for the organization. They need to deal with the expected uh, data volume and growth rate. Um, they have to decide on where to deploy it in the cloud, on-prem. Uh, are they going to use virtual machines or containers? Um, and then any specific runtime requirements. Do they have latency requirements for transactions? Do they have a lot of throughput? Are there a lot of reads and writes coming in and out? Uh, do they have uptime SLAs? Um, what, uh, are there anything that are unique to graph uh, database organizations or teams um, that, are, that would be new to an IT organization? Um, I'm not sure I would call it exactly new, but uh, let's just say that there's, there's a variance on something that I think most uh, relational, let's say DBAs at least, would be familiar with. So uh, in the graph world, what you need to be aware of, which is similar to uh, to the relational world, uh, obviously, is that, well, uh, again, above a certain scale, uh, you need to uh, you need to have multiple machines, basically. And in the graph world, what's uh, sort of unique, but also similar uh, to, to the relational about it, is that you need to somehow uh, split your um, uh, your data according to, to what makes sense. So uh, the idea there is that you want to keep data that somehow belong together, on the same node and there's lots of strategies about how to to do that and that can be quite quite involved let's say and this is the reason why uh, we see at least some vendors trying to provide some kind of uh, abstraction let's say uh, over that in the same way that um, uh, relational vendors uh, try to make life easier for, for dbas by not necessarily exposing them to uh, all the uh, the nitty gritty of data distribution and the splitting tables and all that. Some graph vendors have been trying to do the same. So the idea there is that you want to keep uh, nodes that are somehow semantically related close and on the same machine, so that when you uh, when you do uh, graph traversals, you don't necessarily have to go to another machine, which obviously uh, incurs cost and latency and all of that. So we're going to talk about uh, performance and scale. It's a it's an evergreen topic within uh, within IT, but also in graph um, in particular. But let's just uh, go to the next one. For developer, the considerations are um, they are the ones that uh, define the problems that need to be solved and how they will be implemented as use cases. Uh, they are the ones probably that determine the type of workload they're dealing with. Is a transactional analytical uh, knowledge graph, or is there an AI ML component? Um, they're the ones that have to determine uh, the expected data volume and growth rate, and that will affect how they uh, architect their applications. Um, I imagine they probably work with the data science teams to define data model or schema per use case, and then integration with other systems. Uh, those are I guess, I guess the most obvious uh, developer considerations, any uh, that are once again unique uh, to graph, George? I think what's unique about um, this, um, uh, the development, let's say, experience on graph is um, the, uh, the fact that people need to um, get to come to terms with modeling things as a graph so most people are used to thinking in terms of uh, tables and uh, joints and that doesn't always necessarily translate well in the graph world uh, because well in graphs you don't really have joints that's that's the whole that's the whole idea that's the whole reason why people go to uh, to graph databases so you can directly uh, do multi hop queries and that's actually a, a defining characteristic so what would be uh, prohibitively expensive to to run as as a sql query i mean the in terms of even just writing the query but also running the query uh, in graph can be like orders of my it can be orders of magnitude faster so um, one thing to keep in mind there is that well the modeling is different the queries are different and you have to uh, to, to start fresh in a way you have to uh, learn how to model your domain as a graph yeah one of the one of the graph cliches i've learned is that once you uh, start dealing with graphs you see graphs everywhere so I imagine that's uh, probably the same for developers. 
let's finally talk about data scientists. They are helping to define the use cases and the data models and schemas. Uh, they are the ones that are answering business pain points or at least technical business pain, pain points. Uh, they're the ones that look after the expected benefits from the solution, whether it's reducing cost, whether it's protecting revenue, generating revenue, uh, is there a business performance gains to be made? Uh, and they're also probably somewhat determining, you know, the transactional or analytical nature of the use cases. Um, is the is the data science component uh, uh, pretty universal uh, with graph databases or not necessarily, George? I would say um, that what makes some people actually even refer to to graph data science, and I think it makes sense. Uh, in my mind, what makes um, data scientists that work with graph, uh, what makes their uh, their job special is the fact that they get to deal with uh, lots of graph algorithms. So we already briefly spoke about page rank, but there, there are tones really. There's uh, centrality algorithms, there, uh, there are pathfinding algorithms, like I think there are even like hundreds of them. And uh, to make things a little bit easier for, for data scientists, there are also graph algorithm libraries and uh, many solutions, either graph processing frameworks or graph databases actually come uh, bundled with pre-implemented graph algorithms precisely to make the job of data scientists uh, easier. Uh, that said, I mean, it's great to have an out-of-the-box implementation, but uh, it's not going to be much use if you don't know what it does and how to use it and where it's applicable. So um, long story short, um, working as a data scientist, working with graph uh, algorithms gives you a whole new range of capabilities, uh, but also a whole new range of uh, responsibility because you have to learn what they are, what they do, and what uh, makes sense in which scenario. Perfect. So we're a little bit running out of time, and this is the next, the next one is a big topic. Uh, so um, rather than go into depth about it, we're just going to talk at a high level um, that uh, there are really unique challenges with the graph data model and uh, distributed computing and making uh, graphs uh, high performance, real time, etc. Um, so you have the issue of scaling the data itself. Is it going to be in the terabytes? Is it is the is it growing? Is it shrinking? Uh, you have to scale the compute as well. The, the number of people, the number of queries coming in. Can you scale storage and compute independently? Was because if you go to the cloud, for instance, uh, you don't want to have either your cost for data or for compute tied to each other so you can you know kind of right size your budget for for your needs um, the deployment architecture also affects scalability and performance uh, are you using an in-memory approach is it a single instance system which clearly kind of limits your you know your ultimate scale but might give you on a to a certain data size uh, great performance uh, or do you need to go to a distributed model? You know, Aerospike and Tiger both uh, distributed um, by design. Uh, also, once again, uh, are you uh, you know are you virtualizing? Are you containerizing your systems? That of course affects performance and uh, and scale. Uh, also, just the nature of graph queries, the dimensionality. If you're uh, if your graph is very bushy or if it's very tall, if there's lots of uh, edges per node, um, you know, and you're doing multi-hop queries, you know, I, let's take that in particular because it's so unique to graph. Um, all right, so can you talk about multi-hop queries and the, the, the challenge that they represent to, uh, to graph databases? Uh, yeah, sure, I mean, in. In, in a sense, this is what graph databases sign at, but uh, it's also um, hard to handle as the more uh, the more hops, basically, the harder it is. Uh, and again, to, uh, to draw the equivalent from the relational world, um, you can think of it as adding more joins. 
and it may not be as hard or as complex to even express in the graph world as it is in, in the relational world, but still the fact remains that, well, the more hops, the more computational workload you add to your backend, and uh, the more uh, data locality becomes relevant and potentially a problem. So if uh, all the nodes that you're going to traverse in order to uh, to run your query are on the same node, then it's fine. It's, it's predictable, let's say. If you start spanning nodes, then uh, things start getting interesting, let's say, which is precisely why uh, data localization is a big issue and why, you know, there are like lots of uh, strategies on how to deal with that. Yes, and I imagine as the number and type of graph use cases continues to grow, that's going to provide continued challenges for uh, especially yeah. in distributed environments. Um, there's also performance techniques that uh, the vendors use, including error spikes. So uh, indexing of data, um, the uh, in something called index-free adjacency, which we'll talk about in a moment. And then, as you mentioned, data locality all affect performance. So, as I said, this is a topic that could also be a, an hour-long webinar. So we're going to leave it there. The last subject is in uh, the topic of, of native graph databases versus multi-model. Um, what are the differences and does, does one have uh, advantage over the other? So for native, like a Neo4j or a Tiger, uh, they have an optimized storage layout. They're designed for one purpose uh, and they work for ma maximum query efficiency they uh, have this idea of index-free uh, adjacency for fast traversals. Uh, there is a memory penalty you have to pay for that, but uh, like I said, to a certain size of data, that, that may be uh, a worthwhile uh, thing to invest in. Um, for multi-model, of course, the, the, the general uh, benefit of multi-model is their versatility, the, the ability to support multiple uh, use cases using multiple data models, and then you get the operational and cost benefits of a single vendor, a single product, a single management interface, single documentation, and all that stuff. I wanted to point out uh, that there's a, a, a good uh, blog on this topic from our, uh, our Director of Product Management, Ishan Bizwas, uh, called Demystifying Native versus Mo Multi-Model Graph Database Myths. Uh, so check that out. Uh, George, um, it seems like uh, both types of uh, graph databases are making it work. Uh, is there, are there inherent benefits that you would point out of one over the other? I think in a way, this conversation would be very similar, uh, regardless of, you know, whether we're talking about uh, multimodal versus uh, graph or multimodal versus vector or multimodal versus document or, or what have you. So, you know, the benefits of having like a specialized uh, database for your specific data model is that obviously it's optimized for that and its performance is probably going to be um, it's probably going to be a little bit better or you may be able to do more in terms of specialized use cases. On the other hand, the benefit of having like a multimodal database is that you can serve more use cases in general because you're not only limited by uh, one data model and you have uh, less operational complexity and, and cost. So I don't think there's like a clear cut answer. You know, this is like what you should do. This is what everyone should, should do in all cases. It's always, a, and, and it, it depends basically. All right, we're running to the end of our hour. I have a couple of questions come in, so I'm going to end um, pretty quickly now. Oops, uh, why? Oh, that's why. Okay, so I'm gonna finish with just a really brief introduction of Aerospike Graph. Uh, we come from the, the massive scale uh, space where we uh, do payment systems and uh, ad tech, ad auctions at, at an incredible scale. So that is what Aerospike brings to the table, the ability to support billions of vertices, trillions of edges. Uh, we scale compute and storage independently. Uh, we are definitely targeting that real-time OLTP uh, performance 
uh, use cases, at least initially, we'll be adding a bunch of uh, OLAP capabilities with our next release coming later this year. Uh, we have the Gremlin uh, query language. We have bulk loading, both as a batch or also streaming through uh, Spark. And uh, it is, uh, we are the multi-model uh, database. So uh, that's that. The architecture is such that as you see, the graph service in the middle is separate from the database. So it's just, a, it's just an Aerospike database, although it is a natively rendered uh, graph data model with, uh, within the uh, Aerospike database. Uh, and then the, the graph service is based upon Apache Tinkerpop. It's available uh, in the cloud or on-prem. Uh, and uh, you can virtualize. Uh, so I don't want to spend too much time, but uh, that's kind of what we do in the, in the graph space. And I want to get to the final questions. The first, George, is um, uh, Carrie has asked about insights or strategies about migrating. Uh, he says from Neo4j. Uh, but if you could give uh, some helpful hints, not just let, let's just talk, take uh, migrating in general. I mean, how portable is Graph Database, for instance? If you wanted to move your graph data from Neptune or Neo4j to, to or Aerospike or whatever, uh, how easy is that or how hard is that, I guess I should say? It's usually hard. Yes, it's not always straightforward. Obviously, it's much easier if you're migrating uh, between uh, vendors that support the same graph data model. So one RDF vendor to another RDF vendor, it's actually pretty easy. It's one of the key benefits of going with RDF because uh, the data format is standardized. You can export in RDF, import in RDF, boom, you're done. And the query language is standardized. You can keep your queries running pretty much exactly the same, unless, of course, you're using proprietary extensions, which obviously some vendors will implement. But So those are not portable, but like the... Vanilla, let's say, Sparkle is 100% portable. So integration is is pretty seamless. Um, integration, uh, so uh, sorry, uh, porting. I mean, I meant migration. Migration among different um, labeled property graph vendors is less straightforward, but still possible. You would still have to find some intermediate data format that both uh, your uh, vendor of origin and your vendor of uh, destination support. It could be RDF. Some LPG vendors also support that. It could be anything as long as there's a common there's common ground. It could be like CSV. Uh, there's also other graph formats that are somehow supported by uh, by vendors. But either way, you need to port your data, and then you also need to port your queries. Now, porting your queries was probably the weakest spot up until recently. And we hope that the introduction of the GQL standard with, will sort of solve that. But again, if you're migrating, let's say, between one uh, vendor that supports uh, Tinkerpop framework to another one that also supports it, it's fine. You won't have much issues. Your your queries will keep running. If you're migrating from OpenCypher to OpenCypher, same. If you're migrating uh, specifically because um, Kerry was asking about migrating from Neo from J, I presume she meant migrating to something like Aerospike, for example. Now, one good thing about the uh, the Tinkerpop framework is that it's in fact multi-language. So, in the whole concept of having this virtual machine. Uh, on Tinkerpop, you can also, in fact, run uh, Sparkle queries and you can also run Cypher queries. However, as opposed to like native Gremlin queries, they will be interpreted. So they will first get to be translated to Gremlin and then executed. So you add a little bit of complexity and latency there. Okay, it doesn't sound super easy, but it does sound possible. Uh, yeah. the, the next question is, uh, from an anonymous attendee, uh, can a graph database serve as a primary OLTP database for a social network? I wonder if an active uh, activity stream query like find the people I follow and return the most recent posts sort of descending as page one of posts. It seems like it would have to read all posts and those users to be able to order them by date descending. So I, I guess the, the high level question is, could a graph database function as an OLTP database in a social network. I imagine that would depend on the scale, but what, what do you think, George? 
The quick answer would be yes. I mean, that's you know that's the sort of use case that graph database is very very uh, is a very good fit for. Uh, of course, the devil is in the details, and as you said, it also depends on scale. So, if you have a solution that you know can only run in memory, and your memory is limited, or it can only run on one node, and your node is starts getting uh, out of resources, then well, you know, you may it may only get you so far. So, yes, in theory, it's very much possible, and it's actually a very good idea. In practice, uh, you also need to take scale into consideration and choose wisely. Wonderful. All right. Well, that really brings us to the end of our presentation. I just want to leave some final thoughts. Uh, Aerospike is in this space in a big way. We've made a, a, a serious investment in graph uh, databases, the graph data model and Gremlin and uh, and George, you've been very helpful to us uh, in figuring it all out. So thank you for that. So um, in order to uh, engage with us, you can view a demo. You can go to uh, our product page for, for Aerospike Graph. There's the product doc, uh, there are Gremlin tutorials. There's a great online Gremlin tutorial for people who want to learn that. Uh, you can also have a 60 day free trial of Aerospike Graph, so you can try it out now. And um, so we appreciate your time. And uh, this has been uh, very enlightening, George. Thank you very much for your time and thank you all for attending. Any final thoughts you have, George, um, to, the, to the graph world? Well, thank you for having me, first of all. And yes, it's been fun and I, I enjoyed working with you, not just for, for the webinar, but also uh, sort of being being there and watching you through your uh, graph journey, let's say. And uh, well, I hope you uh, you keep going along that journey and I uh, hope that people who uh, joined us today uh, uh, had a good start, let's say, and hopefully it's been helpful and uh, we'll be uh, seeing more people uh, join uh, the graph world. Well, it's safe to say it's a fascinating topic. Uh, just doing the research for this webinar has really been an eye opener and your your perspectives are very much appreciated with that. Uh, we're going to end here. I want to thank everyone for coming. Oops, one second. We have one more question. Oh, it's excellent webinar. Thank you. Uh, thank it's you. More appreciate of the that. And uh, and uh, that'll, that'll do it for today. Uh, have a good day, everybody, and thanks for joining. Thank you.